just jump in and go down the line, explain who you are very quickly because we're short on time and what your relationship is with podcasts. Uh, my name is Jarlith Regan. I make the Irish Man Abroad podcast, which is currently Ireland's number one podcast. And uh, it you is- You can cheer if you want. Yeah, you can all go crazy yeah, then. Yeah, that's yeah. okay. Um, and uh, I'm also a stand-up comic, so in that sense, it's 50% of my livelihood. Okay. But it's, uh, it's probably the thing that's changed my life. Okay, that's pretty major. <laughs> so yeah, my name is Jason Phipps. I'm also an Irish man abroad and also a listener to Jared's podcast. Fantastic. Uh, subscribe now. And I'm head of audio at The Guardian. And The Guardian is a, is a very interesting early starter in the podcast world. In fact, the, the podcast was coined under our uh, masthead. And I didn't know yeah, that. that's what I do. I, I, over, I look over all the podcasts that come out of London, um, increasingly Australia, and in 2016. So, if in the US. Jarlath is 50%, you, are you 100% podcast in your yeah, professional I'm, life? I'm a, I am a podcaster. I think we're, it's increasing. I am a podcaster. Okay. I make a living out of it, yeah. Nate? Uh, I'm Nate Langson, and I'm uh, head of digital at Bloomberg uh, for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And um, I'm also the producer, host, editor, and various other titles probably of, of an independent podcast called Text Message, um, which as far as what it contributes to my livelihood, uh, it doesn't make any money because I don't accept any advertising. So technically, it probably reduces my livelihood. <laughs> um, but, and before that, I was at Wired and CBS CNET doing podcasts and various things there too. Okay. Um, so I know that Jason and Nate, you have been in podcasts for a long time since I don't know, a decade more? Yeah, yeah a decade. 2007. Would you say that, what are we seeing now? Are we seeing an explosion? Are we seeing, what's going on? Why are podcasts so big right now? Why are all these people here to listen to us talk about podcasts? Well, I think it's, I, I've described it as going through something of a renaissance, which is a, maybe slightly grandiose, but I think one of the biggest contributing factors has been that the public en masse, and this is particularly true, I think, in the UK um, and with the BBC iPlayer being what it is, is that the public has got used to the idea of not having to consume content exactly when it's broadcast, and they have got used to the idea of being able to go and get what they want and basically subscribe to it in some way, have it delivered to them in some way. They're using things on their mobile devices. So as people have got more and more familiar with the idea of catch-up TV, catch-up radio, audiobooks, you know, which have become incredibly popular, you know, Amazon owns the biggest audiobook platform in the world, they, um, people are just saying, well, what else is there? You know, they've consumed their catch-up for radio and TV that day. Suddenly, and I used to hate the fact that the radio programs and TV broadcasters had their podcasts in the podcast store. This is going back a few years, because they weren't podcasts in anything but technical uh, description. They were subscribed via RSS. Now, I think that has helped, because it's brought people into the world of podcasting through an interest in consuming on-demand media within something like iTunes or something else. That's one of the reasons I think it's become so much more popular now. And obviously, mobile goes without saying. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's just been said. But I just also think that it is a, an unbelievably powerful way of telling stories about individuals to individuals, because mostly it's consumed, unlike radio, although some people do consume it in their living rooms, mostly people consume it with, with their headphones on. It's a deeply personal form. Uh, I'll hand over to Jarlath because Jarlath actually does it brilliantly. And if you listen to some of his podcasts, you'll hear conversations you would never, ever hear on the radio. Definitely not on RTE, but not anywhere, I don't think, on the radio. Yeah. What, what, what is, what it's, it's about the power of that personal narrative. Yeah, I think there is something about the, uh, the long form of it. Mm -hmm. There's something about it. There's all this stuff underneath, right? There's all that peddling that the swan is doing beneath the water. But the thing itself is quite elegant. And while there is this part of our society that wants a quick Vine video, I want to see it quick, I want to get to the punchline. Equally, there's the other end of the spectrum where you have to commute to work longer than you ever had. Mm -hmm. And in that time, do you really want to be looking out the window, constantly flicking, or can you immerse yourself in that moment and go somewhere that this American life takes you or that serial brought us all. Mm -hmm. uh, and the podcast is what has allowed that. There's the luxury of time, and that's why those conversations are I'll, able to come I'll out. also make a crass generalization, and I tend to do that. Also, it's because 
radio is so fucking boring. It's so boring. Radio is boring. The same people have been on the radio. Jesus, an RTE. In this country, when I come back and I hear the same people on radio, I think, how the, like, have they been preserved by chemicals or something? How have they, I mean, I love long careers, but there's careers in radio that have gone beyond their sell-by date. And, and what podcasting has come in, and especially with people like Jonathan, have come in and literally liber liberated a younger generation who have not been invited into that kind of yeah. other, those there's conversations in broadcasting. There is definitely a punk element to it yeah. in that my show, I remember going to the establishment in this country before I left with this idea and submitting it. And like a lot of people I'm sure here, submitted ideas, they were met by someone who probably has never created anything in their lives and told, no, you'll have to go through the channels to get that done now. There's a, there's a protocol that has to be followed to even come up with an idea in the first place. And then someone at News Talk, Jared Gilroy specifically said to me, fuck all that go and make it yeah. and let them come back to you. Yeah. And I've gone and done that like so many others. And it, it is that liberating idea that you can't tell me that I can't have a talk show. I have all the bits and pieces to do that and now I can access my audience. And that's kind of the punk element that I think people are attracted to about podcasting. Right. Whatever it is you're into, you can find the podcast yeah. about it. Right, and there's also, I mean, a lot of people say that it's a big part of it is personalities, getting really attached to the personalities that oh, you Oh, don't meet. get me wrong, I am amazing. Let's yeah. Be clear on that. <laughs> well, yeah. so what is it, I mean, do you feel like, have you reached celebrity status? Is it, are you getting approached when people hear your voice in a restaurant? Do they come over and? This is the thing that like, I read all these articles, like a lot of people here, I'm sure, what is the future of podcasting? Uh, where is it going? Uh, how, and all these kind of descriptions of how we can get more people to it, how podcasts are upset with their audience at the moment and gaining audience, but what are we aiming for? Like, maybe this is it. That's what I sometimes think. It's like, I've got the people that I know are diehards for this show. They mail me every day. They crowdfund the show. Mm -hmm. Essentially, it's being built by its audience. And among those people, I guess I am a local celebrity. I'm not walking through Dublin ordering things and people going, that's the Irish man abroad. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I even want that. Yeah. Because, like you say, I'm making a nice living from this thing right now. And sometimes when you come to a summit like this and you go to a businessy type meeting of people scratching their heads and you're thinking, they're thinking billions. Right. I'm thinking pure freedom, uh, total ownership of my, my art, mm -hmm. and uh, I have that. Well, so, I mean, Jason and Nate, you're coming at it from businesses. Are your companies thinking billions, or what is the, what is the revenue potential in podcasts, as you um, see it? it? It depends, really, because, I mean, traditionally, there's been this problem where podcasts have sat in the middle of two different types of advertising. And on the one hand, you have people in radio and TV and broadcast talking about it and saying, well, actually, that's kind of a digital, that's a display ad thing. And then you've got guys on the other side selling adverts on websites saying, podcast, what is that? Oh, right, when is it broadcast? Oh, you download it. OK. Um, no, that sounds more like radio. Sell Those guys will sell it. And you sit in the middle and think, I'm going to have to sell this myself. Uh, which is fair because you also edit it yourself and host it yourself and you know <laughs> physically order all the parts for the studio yourself So in a way, I suppose that makes sense um, But I think there are podcasts and are podcasts and there are podcasts You know, I voluntarily choose not to have any advertising on on my show text message I've had offers and I turn them down because I largely just want to do a show that I would want to listen to and I you know And while it doesn't cost me a load of money It gives me the freedom to do whatever I want mm -hmm. and I just generally enjoy doing it and I like the fact that you know, if thousands of people want to listen to my voice in their head every week and my opinions, it's not bad. That's yeah. all right. I, I mean, I think this is a very early days. I mean, let's face it, there's only really two or three big players in the sponsorship game in global podcasting. It's Squarespace, right. it's Audible, and it's MailChimp. Right. And that diversification of kind of, of decent-sized companies that want to use uh, podcasting for advertising, that's, it's, just, it's just happening now. So it would be rash and crass for me to say what I think is going to happen, but I'm going to say it anyway, which is I, I think there's a lot of money in terms of advertising for one good reason, which is ad blocker technology won't really work if 
the presenter is advocating the product, mm -hmm. if the products are being chosen because they kind of fit with the podcast and it's kind of baked into the product. And I think it offers podcasters something quite unique. Mm -hmm. And also, like I said, it has that intimacy. So it's not just random. It's not random. It's very kind of, it's very intimate and it's very powerful. It has big impact. And they know that. I mean, we, I, you know, I've seen research and I know that. And I also think that ad server technology, I mean, I've gone through a process over the last six months just looking at ad server technology. And it's so shit. It's so crap. And it's always just this offshoot of another business who serve video for this and that, and nobody really has concentrated on it. But if somebody, and they may be in this room, decides to make a really killer sort of back-end tool to serve ads into audio yeah. in a really sophisticated, fluid way, and th there's, there's huge growth out there because we've only know. scratched the surface. Only 17% of the US have listened to a podcast. 17%. So you can yeah. think of the growth that's there in that. You know. here's, what I, here's what I think on this. is I, I believe when you talk about those top players at this podcast table, I mean, you're talking about Mark Marin, you're talking about uh, Ira Glass, you know, these people... Not really, George. Actually, Squarespace go around the houses and, and offer money to sure. everyone. Sure, and I, they used CPM to sponsor rates. my show. Yeah. And you, what I think the advertisers haven't gotten on to is when Mark Marin pitches the product mm -hmm. in his voice with the occasional expletive, that, that personality is the value, right? He's right. built up a relationship with those listeners. Yeah. I've provided my listeners with 112 free episodes. So maybe they will visit currencyfair.com. Maybe they will sign up and say the Irishman abroad sent them mm -hmm. because there's some kind of relationship of trust. But if I you're gave you this, is, is this a paid you go and do this. Yeah, name like check in this. <laughs> but maybe maybe that, that's another reason why they, they, they're involved, because yeah. they knew that maybe I'll be here yeah. having this conversation yeah. again. I think, right. I think that maybe this idea of a back-end thing that will somehow stream ads in, it'll kind of take away what's beautiful right now, which is that if... And like, I do want to ask this question to this room right now, that Serial, mm. the most phenomenal podcast that's probably ever existed, from every perspective in terms of how it took over the world, made an appeal to its audience to donate in order for a second season to occur. I'd like to know honestly, in this room, who went and donated. All right. That is about <laughs> less than 10%. I mean, well, less than these 10%. are the people <laughs> yeah. that would think I should donate some Have money. They've just done a less deal with 10. Pandora to ad inject exclusively broadcast the next season and use Pandora's player to sort of inject advertising into their Because they've obviously learned that, that but, this well, thing no, no, doesn't... I mean, they, they raised enough money. It's, I mean, I think they raised up in a re region of $600,000 thereabouts. I mean, the original season, the season one cost... I mean, in The Guardian, of course, I am faced. It's a bit of a joke now. People pass me in the corridor and say, hey, Jason, did you hear about cereal? <laughs> because I want to shoot them. <laughs> and I had a lot of senior editorial people say, hey, Cereal? Why can't we do cereal? And I always say, well, great, just give me about half a million dollars, give me the best people in the building, leave me alone for a year with a cold case that doesn't look very interesting on the outside. And, and that was a huge risk. I mean, cereal was a massive risk. Right. It doesn't look like a risk now, but it, it was a massive risk. Um, sure, but, but my point is that like, it was amazing. We all agree it was amazing. But yet here we are, people that have actively got an interest in podcasting, and only 10% of them threw in a few pennies. What? I didn't. I mean, but I'm begging be people more. to donate to my show every week, and yet I didn't donate to this thing yeah. that's probably driven more listeners towards my show but than another, anything else. There's another aspect to this, is that I don't think there's been a single podcast mentioned yet on this stage that didn't originate in the US. You know, I think every single one of these... I produce them all the time. I can mention them. I just didn't want to... <laughs> <laughs> except, our own, except our own. <laughs> and, and the fact is that the US is a more developed market for podcasts. You know, This American Live, very popular. It's on the radio. You know, it's a radio show that goes out as a podcast. And Serial got its first episode put out, you know, the, the Ira Glass personally put it out there and said, here's this thing. Yeah. So it has this instant leg up in the industry because it's coming out of US radio, which is really big. And if you go and ask any American podcaster how much money they think you can make out of podcasting, it will have several more zeros on it than, they, than you ask somebody in the UK or in Europe. Yeah. But there are success stories coming out of, of, of UK and Europe. And, and there's a lot that we can learn from what's happening in the US. There's some big differences that I think are worth highlighting, you know, with the idea of, you know, hosts reading sponsor messages, things like that. If you're a journalist 
and you're reading out sponsorship messages, I think you have to ask yourself why you're doing that. Because I, don't, I think there still has to be that separation between you know, giving what is a personal endorsement for something that you're paid to say, regardless of whether or not you believe it, and I've, you know, that's, that happens. And I don't think the UK is necessarily in a position where that can be considered as acceptable as it is in the US, no, no, where it happens a lot. We're formed by the B BBC. In the UK, media environment, we're formed by the BBC, which doesn't have advertising, which actually makes, say, the Guardian content very valuable because it's predominantly people who access public service content who aren't exposed to advertising do access our content where there's a unique chance to get these kinds of groups of people. But culturally, it is difficult. It's, it's something that we struggle with. We have a kind of an assessment procedure because we have, we're, we're, we're kind of, we've got the Scott Trust. We're not a private business per se. We have a certain kind of set of values that we have to checklist. And it, it, it is problematic. However, I will say, and in Ireland, you know, there's, there's advertising on the public radio here, but in the UK, they need to get the hell over themselves because there's this idea that great content can only come from a kind of BBC model. And there was a huge amount of arrogance and snobbery in the UK about, oh, well, the BBC, well, we do radio. Look, you know, don't cut the BBC license fee because look what happens over there. And then people, a generation, <laughs> have figured out how to use Foxy Proxy and various other ways. And they look at American TV and they go, shit, there's a lot of really good stuff over there. And then they listen to NPR podcasts and they think, wow, that's fantastic, you know? And it's full of advertising. Yeah. And it seems to have not affected the quality. In fact, it seems to have, in a way, sort of spurred on a kind of a, an ambition, in a way, at a lower level. It's allowed for kind of autonomy on a small scale in America, and small groups usually make interesting things. So, public service is a problem in the UK, and culture is a problem in Europe, but it's obviously no problem in the US, and I think that's the reason why there's... Yeah. I, 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 there's, there are huge other problems. Uh, there's, a, there's a massive problem in podcasting. It's huge. It's preventing it from growing into what it should be in the mainstream. And I actually think, probably know, that there are several people, if not dozens of people in this room, who can probably fix this as a problem. And the issue is discovery. Because we're in a world where Google and micro, you know, Google owns DeepMind, you know, AI, machine intelligence, all this kind of stuff. We have things like Watson, IBM Watson, you know, Rob High was, was here yesterday. And you think, how is it you cannot properly search for a podcast? You know, a lot of podcast apps use iTunes database as its back end. You know, it makes it open. You know, all of this data is out there, it's open. RSS feeds are open, MP3s are unprotected. You can do all this kind of stuff. We were promised that we would be, by now, in some era of semantic web, of conversation analysis, of sentiment, of all this sort of stuff, and yet none of this has been applied properly to audio. YouTube had to do it quite early and very well with video to prevent copyright lawsuits, um, you know, over the last 10 years. And they've been able to fingerprint and identify various different things going on in videos, but no one's done it yet properly for podcasts. Anyone who can crack the problem of audio-based discovery and personalization will open the door to basically owning the entire podcast sector, taking over from iTunes, because iTunes is, is brilliant in terms of sending you listeners if you get featured, not a great experience to browse for podcasts. Right. We need to do it with semantics. We need to be able to treat the fact that a podcast might be five minutes, it might be five hours, and there's a chunk of it down here. If you're writing articles on the web, and you're getting a lot of traffic from a website like Reddit or something, if the majority of your readers get more than about four paragraphs down that page, well done. That's pretty successful. When you apply that to a two-hour podcast that you can't even see or scan read in advance, think about what you're missing. Think about the advertising opportunities that exist when you can actually insert adverts during the right sentiment, the right conversation point. Like, and, and the opportunity now, as podcasts have gone global, is to become more locally focused, I think. Well, so it sounds like we have a challenge for the audience. Someone solved this problem. We're out of time, but thank you guys so much. All right, thank you. <laughs>